I'm horny. Hi, world. I'm Gordy. What's something every living thing on planet Earth has in common? They want to get jiggy with it, but not everything wants to get jiggy with them. On this episode, we're getting down and diggity with some of the freakiest ways nature bakes the potato. Most people know about sexual reproduction, when an organism needs another organism to reproduce, but what about asexual reproduction, when an organism can reproduce on its own? One form of asexual reproduction is parthenogenesis, which is when an embryo forms from an unfertilized egg cell. Instead of using sperm, the lady animals use their own genetic material to get the process going. It is relatively rare and can occur in certain types of snails, sharks, turkeys, and sometimes Komodo dragons. This happens randomly and rarely in these other animals, but the New Mexico whiptail, whose entire species is female, depends solely on parthenogenesis to reproduce. You could say if they were put on some sort of large, secret, ancient lizard theme park, nature would find a way. Honeybees can also use parthenogenesis to make little bee babies. Bee reproduction is super duper complicated. So we decided to talk to our friend, Shelly Hoover, a local bee expert, to get the sweet deets. Also, I'm deathly allergic to bees. How do bees mate? Honeybee queens uh, are the only reproductive in the colony. So it's the queen that lays all the eggs in the colony. And she'll mate with a number of different drones, as many as two dozen different drones, but only at one point in her youth. So you'll take a virgin queen and she'll go on a mating flight a number of kilometers from her colony to what's called a drone congregation area. So that's an area where a number of honeybee drones or males will be flying from about 20 to 40 meters up in the air, mate multiple times, and then fly home to the same colony and then in a few days start laying eggs. And it's actually, you know, the queen mates multiple times, but it's not so nice for the drones. The drones actually die after they mate. They avert their endophallus and it kind of explodes. When a drone daddy explodes, can you hear it? Yeah, you can actually hear the audible pop sound when a drone has had sex. His, his endophallus averts and it basically pops. And that's the sound of his body tearing away from his genitals, which he's leaving in the queen. And then the next drone that she mates with has to try and dislodge these with his endophallus. So male drone bees sole purpose is just to kind of like make babies and then just die <laughs> yeah that's pretty much all drones do is they mate and then they die they don't do any work in the hive they don't make honey they don't clean they don't take care of the babies and if they're unlucky and they don't find a queen to mate with their sisters will kick them out in the fall where they'll either freeze or starve to death When it comes to bees, it sure seems like the males are getting the short end of the stick. The same can be said for the golden orb weaver spider. They are victims of something called sexual cannibalism. This is when the female eats the male after they are finished a bit of crumpet. Because of this, male orb weaver spiders try to find the fattest and most well-fed female mates. Why? Because a well-fed female is more likely to spare his life. While some species are deadly when it comes to bopping squiddles, others are total dicks when it comes to raising their young. The brown-headed cowbirds do this thing called parasitic raising. They don't build nests, so when it comes time to have their babies and raise their young, they decide that that <coughs> is someone else's responsibility. While having babies, they will lay 10 to 12 eggs, and one by one will put those eggs into different nests that other birds have made. If there isn't room, sometimes they will even throw the other bird's eggs out of the nest. About half of the mothers will accept this foreign egg. The ones that don't will throw it out, or just build another nest over top of it and pretend like nothing happened. If the mom cowbird comes back and realizes the egg is gone, they will trash the host species' nest about half the time. This is being termed mafia behavior. Every spring, garter snakes celebrate the end of their eight-month hibernation by having a ball, a big sex ball. 
These snake orgies can consist of over 70,000 garter snakes in one big nasty pile. Sometimes the pile gets so big that the snakes at the bottom of the pile will die from suffocation. This snake ball gets pretty competitive. To increase their chances of dipsy doodling, some male garter snakes are born with the ability to release pheromones that trick other male snakes into thinking that they're female. It is thought that this provides a mating advantage because the fooled male snakes try to shaboink these deceptive fellas. This failed mating attempt causes them to waste their precious sexy energy, which allows the pheromone cloak snakes to slither away and sweep the ladies off their feet. Garter snakes might risk their lives from suffocation in a massive sex ball, but very few things work as hard as the salmon for a chance to churn some butter. What is the life cycle of the salmon? Well, there are five salmon, so the life cycle is a little bit different. But in general, they spawn in fresh water. When they're ready, as, as little ones, they migrate to the ocean. In the ocean, they feed, they grow, make migrations, and then they go home again. And the amazing thing is that they go home to the stream where they were born, even probably to the place where they were born. And the question is, how the hell do they know that? Oh, how the hell do they know that? The main thing is odor. They <coughs> imprint, as we call it in our jargon, on the odors, and they can remember it three or four years later, and the odors can be very specific. Our smell uh, power, I think, is about one drop in a thousand drops. The salmon is one drop in several trillion drops. It's almost like it's enough for them to smell one molecule of the odor to know, ah! <laughs> okay, and and for an example, so we could smell something like in a cup of water, but they could smell something in... In this, this whole bay here. How hard is it to get back to that spot at home? Uh, they may be up to 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 kilometers away. And so they have to migrate that distance back. While they're swimming, they also have to collect energy because once they go into the river, into fresh water, they stop eating. They stop eating when they're in fresh yeah, water. Yeah, for the very simple reason that there's no food in the river. All right. Not only that, when you're on near the end, you have to get the eggs in the gravel, so you have to go through spawning behavior, right? And you have to have enough energy to dig a nest, <laughs> to court a female as a male, or a female to court a male, and get the eggs in the gravel. And then you die. Oh, you just die. You just die. Wow, what a ten days after you, ten days after you have spawned, you release your sperm or your eggs. That's it. The hormonal system shifts, and you get ready to die. So, what are some of the freakiest ways nature makes babies? Drone bees will tear their ding-dongs from their bodies for a chance to reproduce. The whiptail don't need no man, and salmon travel thousands of kilometers to the exact spot they were born to spawn and die. Trying to get jiggy with it, something so universal to the creation of life, there's literally hundreds of ways to say bumpin' uglies.